today is World Goth Day. I did not realize that there is a World Goth Day out there. And so that must mean that whole uh, movement has now jumped the shark because as soon as there's a World Something or Other Day, it usually means it's not so cool anymore. I honestly have to be <laughs> up front and say, I didn't realize that goth was still a thing. I mean, although it has been around since uh, I was a teenager, really. I don't think we necessarily called it goth back then. But uh, I was into all the alternative music, which at that point in time, we used to call punk. So, anywho, I don't know if you are a goth. I doubt it, but I don't know. But there is one thing that I do know, and that is the Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I am Jeff McAleer. I'm your host of The Daily Dope, and I am back once again. I also happen to be the Grand Poobah of the GamingGang.com as well. So, welcome aboard. It is Tuesday, May 22nd. Got a pretty uh, interesting show ahead of us. I am going to be reviewing Torg Eternity's Day One Adventures. So, uh, if uh, you caught my review of Torg Eternity, I dig it. A uh, few issues, a little bit with some of the mechanics, but I'm the sort of person that just, you know, kit bashes everything however I want it anyway. I've never run a game that's completely out of the box, I guess we would say. So, uh, I did enjoy it. So, we are going to talk about the Day One Adventures, which is really an introduction to. Torg Eternity and many of the mechanics of the game. Got some news as well. So, do you want to point out if this is your first time visiting? Kick back, relax. This is a very, very casual show. Just me chatting a lot. Uh, I am a chatty person. Do you want to point out also, since this is a live stream, that chat is available. It's available on YouTube. It is not on screen. Uh, I use that uh, to keep the trolls at bay, but... If you have a question or comment or want to say hello, by all means, chime in, say howdy, and I will respond. Of course, when I'm doing my review for Day One Adventures, if you have a question and you want to see a closer look at something, by all means, just ask. All right, so I've got uh, some pretty cool news today. A double dip of Avalon Hill news, amazingly enough. But I do have to point out right away that... Uh, very, very few images for the news items. A little disappointing. But let's jump on into the news because my first Avalon Hill piece has to do with Betrayal at House on the Hill. So if you're a fan of that game, you'll be pleased to know that Wizards of the Coast has revealed more details about the upcoming title in the line, and it's a legacy game. It's Here's the dope on Betrayal Legacy. Betrayal Legacy marries the concept of betrayal at House on the Hill, exploring a haunted mansion, with the permanency and multi-game storytelling exhibited by uh, Devo's Risk Legacy and other legacy games that followed. Betrayal Legacy consists of a prologue and a 13-chapter story that takes place over decades. Players represent families with specific members of a family participating in one story, then perhaps an older version of those characters, assuming they lived, or their descendants showing up in later stories. Why would people keep exploring a haunted mansion for decade after decade, especially when horrible things happen there? Curiosity, I suppose, or perhaps an ignorant boldness that comes from the belief that we know better than those who have come before. Look at all that we've learned. Marvel at the tools we have at hand. Surely we'll all exit safely this time. As with other betrayal titles, the game is narratively driven with elements that record the history of your specific games. The tools mentioned earlier, for example, become attached to specific families. This isn't just a bucket, it's my bucket. The one my grandpappy used to feed his family's pigs when he was a boy. 
And while you can certainly use that bucket, I know how to wield it best from the time he spent teaching me how to slop. Yes, it's an heirloom bucket, and when kept in the family, I get a bonus for using it. That sounds kind of weird. So, like, I got my bucket. I'll be able to handle these horrors ahead of us, because I got my grandpappy's bucket. Regardless, Betrayal Legacy is for three to five players, ages 12 and up, and each scenario should take about an hour to play. The game will carry an MSRP of $75 when it arrives on November 9th. I have never played any of the Betrayal games. I mean, we're talking all the way back to the original. I have never played them. Uh, I know Elliot Miller, my best friend over at voiceofe.com, he says the Avalon Hill, uh, well, I should say the Wizards of the Coast Avalon Hill edition is interesting, uh, although the components are kind of meh. But, don't know. I have no idea. Maybe we'll end up seeing this come November. I don't know. We'll have to find out. Anyway, as I mentioned, I've got two news pieces from Avalon Hill. And just in time for Halloween comes the World War II zombie mashup, Axis and Allies and Zombies from the Wizards of the Coast imprint Avalon Hill. And I've got a wee bit of dope about the game. Axis and Allies and Zombies takes the beloved World War II strategy classic Axis and Allies and adds a fun alternate history twist with streamlined gameplay, curveballs like chainsaw tanks and zombie mind control rays, and a zany storyline strategy fans everywhere will enjoy. I don't know. It's World War II, folks. I don't know. Zany and World War II do not necessarily go together well. So I'm a little, uh, a little leery about this. Anyway, the game will include a game board, a smaller battle board, five setup charts, 70 cardboard tokens, 18 dice, 50 stacking plastic tokens. So of course, if you've played any of the Axis and Allies games, you're used to the plastic tokens, which are basically bingo chips. 215 plastic miniatures, including 30 all-new zombies, 60 cards, and blech, paper money. Blech. Access and Allies and Zombies is for 2-5 to five players, ages 12 and up, takes 1-3 to three hours to play, and will carry an MSRP of $40 when it hits stores on October 26th. $40 is pretty small price tag, so... I don't know. Looking at the back of the box, it looks like that's a pretty good sized board. I don't think it's, it may not be as large as the traditional Axis and Allies, but uh, I don't know. $40 seems really reasonable. So I'm not sure. Uh, it could be very cool. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's uh, just the way they present it as a zany storyline, but it's also World War II. Yes, I understand you're tossing zombies into it. But zany, I mean, bizarre, horrific. Well, World War II is already horrific. How much more horror do you need? But yeah, it's just uh, just kind of strange the way that Wizards of the Coast presents this game. Although, could be pretty cool. Don't know. Might get a chance to see that in October 2. I don't know. I I got to admit, the, uh, the folks who handle the PR for D&D... &D, from Wizards of the Coast are great. I always get just about everything coming out for Dungeons and Dragons. And I think the only time that I really missed out was when I was in the middle of a move. So uh, I believe that's uh, that's what, what's happened previously where I might miss a book for 5th edition. But uh, I never have... Uh, well, yeah, maybe I have. I think, yeah, I, I have gotten some other Wizards of the Coast stuff. But it's always D&D related. Really never anything else related. Sometimes I'll get some magic. But I should reach out and find out um, who might be handling the Avalon Hill stuff and take it from there. All right, so North Star Games is bringing a Polish strategy game to North America this August, and it looks pretty cool. It's called Warsaw City of Ruins, and I've got the dope. 
originally published as Capital in Europe by Grana, Warsaw City of Ruins is set to be introduced by North Star Games at this year's Origins Game Fair in Columbus, Ohio. This tile placement game about the rise and fall, and rise again, of Warsaw in the 20th century is a fast, elegant, yet thematic game where players build the city of Warsaw over the course of the 20th century. This game has amazingly flown under the radar of some of Europe's bigger brand name board games, states Dominic Kripchetis, founder and co-president of North Star Games. But it's a fantastic game and has received early praise from the Dice Tower and Rado runs through it. All right, well, I would, I would think praise from the Dice Tower to me means something. The other shill, no. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, no. The guy who will not supposedly do a negative review. Yeah, all right, moving right along. He's a shill. I'm telling you right now. We're excited to make this game available in the U.S. this summer. Warsaw City of Ruins will be available in stores this August. It does carry a retail price of $49.99. However, there will be a limited supply of games available for pickup at Origins. For anyone interested in reserving a copy, Warsaw City of Ruins may be pre-ordered at the North Star Games website. The game is for two to four players, ages 10 and up, plays in about an hour, and will carry an MSRP, as I mentioned, of $49.95. Is it 95 or 99? Maybe it's 99. When it arrives this summer. As I mentioned, this looks pretty interesting. And uh, I have uh, heard about Capital. And it's sort of like uh, Warsaw is destroyed during the war. Uh, and then, of course, it's being rebuilt. It looks pretty interesting. I'm kind of surprised that it's for ages 10 and up. Seeing that there is an aspect to the game where Warsaw is going to be pretty much ruins. So, I don't know. All right, finally, the newest supplement is available now for Fate, and it's something that's right up my alley, as it's the Horror Tool Kit. Here's the dope. Something lurks in the shadows. Maybe it's a masked killer or a creature from the unknown depths or a psychotic porcelain doll. Or maybe it's just a cat, and the threat stands right behind you. The Fate Horror Toolkit offers a variety of tools, mechanics, and hacks to help you develop thematic horror in your game. Explore what horror is and how to employ it effectively at your table. Learn how to develop horrific elements in Fate, a game system designed around competent, proactive characters not usually seen in horror. Pick from a variety of mechanics to easily design your own game about the things that go bump in the night. The Fate Horror Toolkit is a Fate Core supplement. This toolkit includes extensive tools to make scary and effective horror adversaries and running Fate games where doom is inevitable. Modified and thematic compels designed to help... Oh, okay, I get it. Help up the suspense and visceral horror elements in your games. A variety of new aspect types, such as legacy and intensity aspects, to help develop thematic horror elements and define boundaries. A campaign framework work for running horror stories based on teamwork, particularly good for younger audiences. And the Fate Toolkits, all the tools to build your stage. The Fate Horror Toolkit PDF is 152 pages in length and can be had from our friends at Drive Through RPG for $10. Very nice, very cool. Uh, cool to see some more horror stuff hitting for Fate. I do believe I'm. Um, uh, is it? I believe it's Fate of Cthulhu is their Lovecraft Mythos uh, line. So uh, pretty cool to see them bring some some other horror aspects to Fate because Fate to me is usually kind of uh, over the top heroic action and adventure, not necessarily for horror. Uh, sometimes I would think Savage Worlds maybe if I'm looking at like a generic kind of system to do horror games. So it's cool to see Fate getting more horror uh, items or supplements out there. 
All right, so I do want to also point out, if you do visit Drive Through RPG, please stop by thegamingang.com first, click on one of our banners for the drive through sites, and that way, if you do make a purchase, we'll get a small portion of that sale, and that really does help keep the gaming gang and thus the Daily Dope around. He usually pays for our hosting, and our hosting is not cheap. So there you have it. That is the news for today. Uh, I really wish I had some more images I could have shared to, to get a better look at stuff because uh, outside of there's one, it, there was one image for Betrayal Legacy. There were two images for Axis and Allies and Zombies. And once again, that was just the cover art in the back of the box. And then uh, Warsaw City of Ruins looks really interesting. Only have the one image for that so far. Uh, there's some stuff for capital out there, but it's kind of like, well, things might be changed. I don't want to share images of a, of a different game. And then, of course, uh, the PDF on Drive Through RPG. You're only going to get the cover for it. So, anyway, uh, before I jump into my review, just a few different things I wanted to uh, kind of discuss real quickly. Uh, one thing, uh, I have had a few people touch base uh, through the mailbag, which I swear, one of these days, I'm going to just change mailbag at thegaminggang.com to Jeff McAleer at thegaminggang.com because it's really me, you know, checking out the mailbag and nobody else uh, associated with the gang because digging through the mailbag. But uh, they were kind of uh, kind of discussing how we're seeing uh, a change in tabletop gaming as far as board games, card games, things like that, where we're not seeing as many games that will run more than an hour, more than about 60 minutes. Seems like the big focus now is on games to be completed in about 60 minutes or less. Now that's not true with everything. And I do tend to try to focus my news more on games which are a bit more epic uh, because I'm a huge fan of epic games. I enjoy sitting down and playing a big, uh, it doesn't even have to be like super strategic or meaty or anything like that, but I enjoy playing a couple or more hours with a game that has a, a nice story, a nice flow. It's creating a tale uh, that I can share when the game is over. Oh, as uh, Smokey's uh, hopping around down here, I was going to say I've got both kitties down here in the duct tape studios today, and uh, both were very quiet so far until Smokey decided she was going to knock something over. Come here, Smokes. Come on. Goofball. It's funny because just before the show started, I'm, we're talking like a minute or two before the show started, she was getting ready to hop up on my lap, which she will do from time to time during the show. And I'm like, come on, come on. And she's like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was like, fine. Not hopping up. You're not hopping up. It's okay. All right. So anyway, so uh, back to what I was saying. A lot of people are, are talking about how you know we're seeing the uh, a lot of these game companies are really just focusing on games that are played in an hour or less. And I find that's unfortunate because, yes, and I get that people don't have as much time to play games as <laughs> obviously when I was a teenager and pretty much my summer vacations were spent hanging out with Elliot and the rest of the guys and mainly it, we just played games all the time maybe we'd go to the beach or the movies or go out on dates and stuff like that but there was a lot of gaming involved so of course yes these days most people even teenagers don't have that sort of time to invest but the problem I see is a lot of these games that are coming out there are, are designed to be played in like 45 minutes um, just don't have staying power they really don't. And I've noticed that when I'm doing reviews and uh, I'll be with uh, Elliot and my nephew Cameron and, and some of his friends from his high school that all get together. They're all, you know, part of the gang. And we're playing something and I'm, I'm, I'm working on doing reviews for games that take about an hour. I'll, I might bring two or three of them for an evening or afternoon when we're gaming. And a lot of times we play through a game and then we're moving on to the next game and it's sort of like, there's nothing about, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, the game might be fun. I might give it a pretty good review uh, as far as scoring that. 
but it doesn't have a lasting impression. A lot of times, a lot of these games that are designed to be played in an hour or less are normally not going to leave that big of an impression on you. And of course, there are a lot of people out there now who just, uh, they, they, they play a game and it's like, it's okay. And a lot of reviewers as well. And it's like, well, if it's just all right, then it's like, oh yeah, big thumbs up, blah, blah, blah. Where the reality is the game is just all right. And part of that reason, I think, is that, you know, many of these designers are shooting at just, you know, 45, 60 minute play time. Sometimes we see these games, 20, 30 minute games. And it's kind of like, really? Just how jam packed with excitement is that 20 minute game going to be? So it's kind of sad because a lot of those more epic games really stuck with you. You would play an epic game and you would remember that game, a particular game session of that. You might remember that for years, how amazing it was. Normally don't run across that in a game that you play in about 30 minutes or 60 minutes. So yes, I do see, I do see a move towards that, especially in the uh, realm of more, ca I don't want to say more casual gamers, but I would say in the realm of people who don't play heavy strategy games. So, I mean, of course, fans of companies like GMT and Compass Games and Legion War Games. Those those folks are used to investing three or four or more hours into a game, you know? So it's not it's not like, oh geez, you know, I I, I, I can't play a two hour game. Or people who are into heavy strategy games, same thing. They're they're used to playing 90, 120, 180 minutes in a game. But uh, some of these other games where you could probably do a 90-minute gameplay and get, a, get a, a lot more meat to the design, which would leave a much uh, deeper impression on you after playing it, they're not. They're just shaving corners, streamlining gameplay, and, and just doing, you know, 30, 60 minutes. And it's too bad. It's too bad. Because, of course, it's not like they're lowering the prices all that much because the game only plays in an hour, right? Anyway, so coming up on the show this week, tomorrow, I am going to review Renegade from Victory Point Games, my pals over at Victory Point Games. It's a cyberpunk card game for one to five players. Thankfully, it plays in about 90 minutes, and this game does have a bit of meat on its bones. It's pretty cool. I'm not going to give too much away, but... Uh, it's one of those kind of games where it's like, yes, the 90-minute gameplay for, you know, four players uh, left an impression. It certainly did. Thursday, I'm kind of up in the air. Uh, Thursdays are role-playing uh, days, really, but I have been focusing a little more on role-playing games for the past week or so. And, uh, of course, there is going to be an RPG. I just don't know which one I want to do yet. I've got a few that I can do. Uh, Free League is supposedly, I think, unless I misunderstood, they're supposed to be sending me some physical copies of some of their games, like Tales from the Loop, Mutant Year Zero, so on and so forth. So uh, I have been peeking at their, their PDF. So if that shows up, probably going to do uh, a first look, maybe at one of those. Uh, otherwise, I might do uh, another Dark Eye. I might do another Torg book, because I have another Torg adventure book that I can do a review of, uh, kind of up in the air, so I don't know on Thursday. Friday is really up in the air, because I don't know if I'm going to go camping for the weekend. So there is no show on Monday, because of the holiday. I don't do shows on major U.S. holidays. So, uh, still up in the air. Don't know, but uh, I'll find something we can we can discuss. Strangely enough, I have a gaming chair that's being sent to me from eWin Racing. And uh, it's like a $400 gaming chair that they want me to review. And it's kind of like, um, you, you do kind of realize I don't do video game stuff, really. Sometimes I might touch upon uh, video games or app games, things like that. I, but I'm like, I'm not like a console game sort of guy. They're like, no, that's cool, because you know what? It's perfect for sitting around the gaming table, too. So I'm like, okay, all righty. So that's supposed to actually show up tomorrow. 
So uh, I might actually shoot a little video of uh, how easy it is to put together and stuff like that. So I do not know. But uh, I will know ahead of time if there's going to be a show on Friday or not. All right, moving right along. I'm sure some folks are tuning in because they want to see the Tour of Eternity Day 1 Adventures book from Ulysses North America. It is written by Shane Lacey Hensley, Daryl Hayhurst, Marcus Plotz, Dean Gilbert, and Ross Watson. Art is provided by, and I am going to apologize right up front because I guarantee I'm going to get some of these folks' names incorrectly pronounced. Chris Bevins, I should say Bivens, I believe. Matthias Calza, Dennis Darmody, Talon Dunning, Bien Flores, Gunship Revolution, Alita Saxon, and Andy Trebold. The adventure book is 145 pages in length. It's available in hardcover for $29.99 or in PDF. Once again, for my friends over at DriveThruRPG for $14.99. Let's move on uh, over to the other camera here. Scoot that out of the way. Boy, I tell you, the uh, Brandon Sanderson Mistborn Adventure Game does a lot of double duty as uh, the, um, the stand for various books. What I do in reviews. So this is the Torg Eternity Day 1 adventure book uh, from Ulysses North America. It is, uh, as I mentioned before, it's available in hardcover and PDF. And as you can see, it is the typical, really nice work from Ulysses. As far as you got the, the nice little bookmark there. It's got a, got a cool finish to it. It's got a little bit of gloss, a little bit of matte. And... The possibility wars have begun. So if you did follow my Tor Eternity review or my first look at the Torg Eternity core book, or if you're familiar with Torg from the original West End Games release, you know that the, the game setting is that of the Earth being invaded by these other kind of dimensions, these other realms, these cosms. And how these cosms invade is they'll actually kind of set down in various areas of the world. And then their reality warps our own reality. Their reality actually overwhelms ours. So very, very cool. Really gonzo kind of setting. I am really digging the whole Torg vibe. Uh, because to me, I have spent so many years pretty much running... Call of Cthulhu, that it's always cool to kind of look at some different different systems and stuff that is just really apples to oranges. Uh, although I do have to admit, changing topic, of course. Come on, you watch the show, you know I always go off on these little tangents of that. Uh, Doug from Fantasy Grounds uh, did touch base with me. I had mentioned uh, I had reached out to Fantasy Grounds about you know, I might do some remote role playing with uh, some of my, with like Elliot, my friend Ed, who now my friend Ed lives all the way out in Albuquerque and that, but he was part of the gang, the original gang uh, back in the day. And uh, probably my nephew Cameron would be part of it. And uh, I had thought of utilizing Fantasy Grounds. And I did reach out to Doug at Fantasy Grounds. He's like, yeah, he's set me up. He set me up with a license. And he, uh, I, I had asked him, I said, hey, is there anything that you'd like me to kind of share a little extra love for? Because I mean, most people know about D&D &D and Pathfinder on Fantasy Grounds. I said, is there, you know, a different system you want me to share a little love for? I said, well, you know, uh, Call of Cthulhu, we got Call. And I'm like, well, only run that for decades, sure. <laughs> I'll be happy to take a look at it with Call of Cthulhu. So anyway... All right, so I thought that was kind of cool. So uh, not only am I looking at, I, I want to run some Torg Eternity uh, here around a table, because obviously you've got those um, those drama cards that uh, I, I'm sure you could figure out a way to, to incorporate those remotely. But anyway, 
Uh, so not only am I going to run some Torg Eternity, but I'm also going to run um, some remote stuff for uh, my buddy Ed, who I had not seen for, gosh, about 22 years, up until a couple weeks ago. We got together when he popped into town. All right, so let me uh, wet the whistle here. And turn our attention to Tori Eternity. So as I mentioned before, really nice quality book. Uh, and when I did my interview with Ian Starcher and Eric Simon from Ulysses North America, they're, they're really, uh, I, I really did notice when we were taking a look at some of the books before these physical books arrived at my house, uh, I was going to say, I could really tell that uh, the quality of the production is top notch. Really, really nice. Uh, I don't know of anybody in the role playing game industry, uh, in the genre, who makes better books, nicer books, uh, just co component quality kind of wise than uh, Ulysses. So the Day One Adventures includes introductory adventures for the various different invading cosms. So the premise of day one is that it's an introduction for the players and the game master to the Torg system and utilizing the various different mechanics using the drama deck, how the dice work, how the exploding dice mechanic to Torg, how uh, you've got the different success levels, things like that. So that's what these adventures are focused on. It is not an ongoing campaign. Each one of these adventures have different pre-generated characters. Of course, you're welcome to have your, your players roll up their own characters for each of the adventures. Personally, I would not go through that much trouble simply because most of these adventures will be fairly short. So I do have to point out before I start diving into this that I am going to be talking about the various different adventures that are in day one. If you are a player and you're getting into a tour campaign, or even if you're just going to play some one-offs with your group and your game master, I would say uh, might as well tune out now <laughs> because you don't want to ruin some of the surprises. There are going to be some spoilers I'm not going to delve too deeply into each of the adventures because I don't want to spoil everything for them. But I do want to give uh, my thoughts about each of the adventures and what it actually tackles as far as teaching the various different aspects of the core rules. So we've got the uh, we've got an introduction. Plus, I'm going to show the book off because I have not done a first look at Torg day one. So we're going to actually go through pretty much each of the pages here, just give people a good look at how, how nicely presented this book is. Now I will point out from the core book to the day one adventures, there is some recycled artwork. And to be honest, there's quite a bit of recycled artwork and some of the artwork doesn't really seem to jive with what's going on in each of the adventures. Um, Got to ding the book a little bit for that. Uh, I'm, I ding it more for recycling the artwork as opposed to, well, this art doesn't necessarily fit what they're talking about on these pages here. But, uh, and I can understand. I mean, this is this is early, uh, you know, out of the shoot for Ulysses North America with their Torg products. This came out... Uh, not long after the core book came out. And I believe, I think the core book, gosh, off the top of my head, I think the core book came out in 2017. So uh, there was a Kickstarter for The Living Land. And uh, that looks pretty cool. That looks really cool. And that, that looks like it might address some of the issues that I have with Torg overall right now. And I will mention that in just a few minutes. Okay, so anyway, so talks about the adventures, talks about, yes, you're learning the game, suggested order that these adventures be run in, which 
is in the order that they're presented. Some additional materials as well. Talking about the moment of crisis where the Storm Knights move from being just regular people to uh, being able to, to becoming Storm Knights where they can actually manipulate reality, the possibilities. Uh, talking about starting card hands, what ha happens after day one. Talking about the acts and the scene breaks because Torg is run in acts which are made up of scenes. That's not uh, a radically di different departure than uh, from a lot of other role-playing games. There are quite a few different role-playing games nowadays where it's, okay, so you've got an act, and these are the scenes that make up the act. All right, what's going on there, Pinky? What are you complaining about? Hmm? Yeah, why don't you cop up, take a nap? You were sleeping earlier. <laughs> she's a good kid. She's just likes to make noise when I'm down here. She's usually really quiet, but when I'm talking, she'll start. Wow. All right, Moon Run Long. Hey, it's a live show. What can I tell you? So we get into the uh, pre-gen characters right here. This, this first adventure is going to take place in New York on day one. And New York will become part of the living land which is kind of a throwback to, um, oh, I, I always say that it's like the land that time forgot in certain aspects. Uh, it's very uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs-ish. Uh, there are these, uh, these intelligent reptile creatures, lizard men, not all men, but lizard creatures uh, who are the, the main enemies. So these are the pre-gen characters. What I thought was a little weird is you'll see as we page through the adventure, there'll be images for uh, the pre-generated characters. To me, I thought, well, it would have been kind of easier just to kind of pop them in to the uh, the pages here that talk about the the characters. So, and you'll also see that these, these characters, these pre-gens will show, okay, so these are the characteristics of the character before they have their moment of crisis and awaken the possibility within them and become Storm Knights. So, as far as the adventure, Act 1, The Living Land, I like this one. Uh, this is the longest of the adventures that are in the book. I am the first to always point out that I am not familiar Okay, I'm a little bit familiar now with the original Torg. As I and I have done some reading of some of the original books. And I I get that the Living Land kind of ended up getting kind of a kind of the shaft. Uh, a lot of people didn't care for it. Didn't seem all that exciting. Uh and compared to some of the other cosms a lot of players prefer the other Cosms playing in, in it as opposed to the Living Land. So my understanding is there's there's uh, more of a focus because like the 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 main bad guy, the High Lord, uh, because each of these Cosms is ruled by a High Lord. Um, they kind of made him sort of like a buffoon eventually in the original Torg and things like that. So I believe there's a real uh, a real focus towards making the living land a, a much more entertaining cosm to play in. And uh, that is actually, and well, of course, and it's the U.S., right? It's the U.S. and Canada and in New Mexico. So considering that most of the people, you know, no offense to anybody out in Europe or anything like that, but most of the people who are going to be playing Torg are probably going to be English speakers from North America, I can see where they're, you know, trying to put a focus on the living land because it takes place in the United States. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's like the best cosm, but I do like this adventure. So the adventure basically is the, uh, the characters are on a tour boat and uh, it's opening day. It's... <laughs> for the Major League season, for Major League Baseball. It's met the opening day for, at least for the Mets. 
and uh, the Maelstrom Bridge, which is how these cosms attack, these, these massive, and they're all different kinds of constructs. These bridges smash into the, <laughs> into the world. And, you know, most of these, like, uh, monsters and villains and stuff like that come pouring down these maelstrom bridges. It's not the case with every invasion from the Cosms, but in most. So it's kind of interesting that the, the maelstrom bridge actually lands right in the middle of City Field. So the player characters are tasked with making their way back to land from... Uh, being out on, uh, I think they're out on the Hudson River, if I remember correctly. And uh, so they spend um, uh, the first act in the water, trying to make their way back. Then, then they end up back on dry land, and they really get to see what's going on with this transformation that New York and much of the East Coast is undergoing with the introduction of the living land. So even just within moments, uh, metals, non-living things really start to decay. Whereas living beings tend to uh, be much more passionate. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a deity uh, who uh, kind of oversees the living land and uh pretty cool so all of a sudden within just you know within moments everything's starting to deteriorate rot uh another thing about the different cosms in torg is that uh there's axioms so you'll have like social axioms you'll have a tech axiom you have a spirituality axiom uh which so what you're looking at is that um certain like tech levels or societal levels so for an example the living land has a pretty low social axiom because people can't think of uh things larger than say a tribe or when when the people start uh changing becoming more primitive they may remember how a smartphone what a smartphone did they don't know how to use the smartphone, which, of course, smartphone probably would not be working anyway in the living land because their tech axiom is so low. So what happens when these cosms invade, they change the reality. And that's one of the things I really think is pretty cool. And one of the cool things about Storm Knights is the Storm Knights can utilize things that conflict with the axioms. Now, sometimes they might fail, but uh, so for an example, you know, most human beings would not be able to operate uh, a helicopter in the lost land, whereas a storm knight probably can because they can manipulate that reality. So very, very cool. Definitely dig this. Uh, so anyway, so the rest of this adventure is basically the player characters learning how to use the drama deck, uh, combat, and things like that. And eventually what they're trying to do is they're trying to find, make their way out of New York because around the world there are what's known as hard points, hard points for our own reality. And they may actually even be in the midst of these other cosms that have invaded because these cosms haven't like taken over the entire world. They're not everywhere. In fact, they actually take up a very small portion of the planet. But um, but these hard points are areas that have like a, a, a historical bond to the people who live there. So for an example, like Philadelphia is a hard point in the United States because it is the home of the revolution, of the American Revolution. So... Uh, Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian Museum is a hard point for, uh, for the, you know, for America. So it's very cool. Pretty cool how it works. A little tricky as far as, you know, uh, because it'll, they'll talk about, uh, 
dominant zones, pure zones, mixed zones. And it's talking about our reality and the invading reality. The invading reality is is pure, where it's basically, well, you're going to have a really hard time uh, doing things that don't fit with the axioms of that, of that cosm. Then you've got mixed, uh, which it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to be able to, as for storm nights, then you also have like dominant, uh, dominant zones. And, uh, it's, it's all explained on the map. So anyway, so, uh, like I said, I like the artwork. The artwork's pretty cool. Some of it's like brand new. So for an example, they're kind of showing it's supposed to be the Holland tunnel. I'll tell you right now, the Holland Tunnel is not two lanes. <laughs> so, yeah, <clears throat> not sure who is who is writing this, but uh, the Holland Tunnel is not uh, not two lanes in the Holland Tunnel. But you get the gist. You understand. So anyway, so your player characters are trying to make their way out of uh, New York, and then there's kind of an epilogue. The epilogue kind of talks about how, you know, maybe they get brought into, how those characters get brought into the Delphi Council, which is kind of a shadowy organization that is uh, fighting back against the different cosms. So then we've got uh, some different uh, stat blocks for the different monsters, different creatures. Gotta say, a little disappointed, no artwork. Really no artwork. Now, the uh, Edinos, which are the uh, the uh, lizard people who are prevalent in the living land, uh, there's artwork of, of them all throughout all these different books, so it's not like, okay. But it would have been nice to see some artwork for some of these threats that are provided these stat blocks. Uh, then there's some handouts here. Then we move into the next adventure, which takes place in Isle, which is kind of a fantasy setting. Now, this is the second longest of the adventures. Uh, I thought this was all right. I thought this adventure was okay. Uh, one of the things that I, I've, I've kind of found with the, uh, at least the two products that are available adventure-wise for Torg Eternity is no one's really pushing the envelope with the system. Nobody's really going all out or, excuse my French here, balls out providing something that's like, whoa, man, that's blowing my mind. You know? Whoa, that adventure is crazy. Of course, you have to keep in mind, so far the only two products that are from Ulysses North America. Now, there's stuff that's out on Drive Through RPG, which is part of uh, almost like the Dungeon Masters Guild is for Wizards of the Coast, Ulysses has that uh, so that people actually produce their own like adventures, supplements, things like that for the Ulysses games. There may be like campaigns and stuff, but they are not from directly from Ulysses North America. So anyway, so once again, this is another setting where the players will be transformed by the attacking Cosm. All of these adventures pretty much are the same exact kind of setting where it's just regular folks and boom, suddenly there's the invasion and the cosm changes the reality and those players will or should be changing with that reality, becoming Storm Knights. So, anywho, so... Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this one here. It's just kind of a little bit of a, a little bit of a dungeon delve without being real exciting. I mean, it's not bad. It's not terrible. Don't get me wrong. It's not terrible. But to me, it just it didn't didn't take advantage of the fact that Isle is supposed to be kind of a traditional sword and sorcery fantasy setting. That's what the Cosm basically is. Uh, so I was kind of like, eh. Although, to be honest, you'll find that many players shouldn't have a very difficult time kind of sinking their teeth into an aisle setting, especially if they have played games like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or any number of other fantasy role-playing games. 
All right, so we've got that. Then, of course, once again, we've got the epilogue, which talks about, okay, well, what, what happens after the, you know, the first, first few days, which are pretty much what each of these day one adventures are. They encapsulate the first few days in that cosm for those characters. I apologize. It looks like I'm getting uh, some glare here that I wasn't noticing. But anyway, sorry about that. Then next... Oh, and then we've got the threats again. And I, I could have swore. I, th I think this is another image that's recycled. Uh, but yeah, once again, not really getting uh, images for these threats. All right, then we're going to move into our next set of characters. And this one is Pan Pacifica. Pan Pacifica is a fairly unique cosm as it's a, a complete revamp from the original Torg. So original Torg, uh, Pan Pacifica was uh, Nippon tech, and it was like a a high tech sort of um, sort of setting. A lot of um, almost almost yeah like a cyberpunkish setting uh which is interesting in itself but kind of conflicts with the cyber pope as well it's a little too much of the same uh and i understand there were some folks who were like uh you know the way the the japanese are presented with this nippon tech not not exactly you know I'm not saying it was racist, but it was sort of like, mm -hmm. so Pan Pacifica actually occupies more than just Japan. Uh, Pan Pacifica now is, it's pretty cool. It's, uh, it's psionics, but it's also kind of, uh, kind of like a zombie apocalypse sort of one, but once again, kind of high tech cyberpunk, uh, conspiracy sort of uh sort of setting there so this adventure is uh fairly entertaining uh it's pretty short and it is more than likely uh not going to end well for the player characters so that is probably gonna maybe irk some players out there uh there are two adventures that i would be surprised if the entire party survives so which is which is all right with me because the premise of these adventures is to introduce the players to the various different aspects of the game the mechanics of the game as opposed to all right we want you to just be totally in love with these characters here with these pre-generated characters now one thing that i kind of look at is and something that i'm kind of considering uh, doing would be to utilize each of these adventures and the surviving player characters will actually go kind of into a pool of storm knights so uh, each of the players can can decide you know who do they really like from the these standard stock pre-gen characters uh, to who they want to keep as a possible pool of characters that could be used in further adventures when we start getting into more campaign adventures more of a continuing storyline so all right so anyway so we've got these uh kind of uh kind of zombies they're uh they're they're called i, I believe it's pronounced yangji so uh so that's kind of in in this ass uh in this game as well so i thought uh in this adventure i should say so i thought that was that was kind of cool but like i said this probably is not going to have a good ending for the players and this is also a very short adventure as well then we've got tharkhold which tharkhold is pretty bizarre it's uh kind of like these demons who invaded uh russia and the Russians were able to fight back. And they were able to nuke one of these maelstrom bridges. And now there's kind of this odd kind of uneasy alliance between these demons and 
uh, and the Russians and, you know, other uh, Eastern European countries that have uh, been invaded by this cosm. So uh, this one's all right. This this is uh, this is where it's a military team that's being sent in to uh, on a on a recovery mission. Once again, this is pretty short. This is a pretty short adventure. This game, this adventure here is is really set up mainly to uh, teach kind of the uh, the chase sequence mechanics of the game. Uh, there are these these scenes that can come out where there are going to be multiple uh, multiple objectives that the players have to complete in a in a short period of time. Uh, so it's like a race against time sort of mechanic that you use the uh, drama deck for, and that's what uh, what this adventure is mainly set up for. Uh, once again, but pretty short. It's a pretty short adventure. Like I said, the longest. The longest adventure is the Living Land adventure. And honestly, I would think that Living Land adventure should probably take you a game session. If you're like me and you your game session is like four or five hours. Uh, if your game sessions are only a couple hours, no. But uh, the Living Land should run uh, a good game session, maybe even two, depending on how long you, you usually um, get down, sit down together for, for a game. The Isle adventure, probably takes close to a, a game session. A lot of these other ones, you could probably, if as long as you've got everything set up with your pre-generated characters and that, some of these are short enough that if you do play like five hours, five, six hours, if you if you spend an afternoon, if that's your how your group gets together and you game for an afternoon, you could squeeze in a couple of these, really. Uh, then we got the Nile Empire, which... Funny enough, the Nile Empire is like, in my opinion, the most gonzo of the Cosms. It's kind of a 30s pulp slash Egyptian pharaohs kind of setting. Uh, I think it's like probably probably going to be the uh, the most over the top of the Cosms that uh, you can run. And I gotta admit, I found this adventure to be eh. Which, uh, which was, you yeah, know, unfortunate. Uh, a little unfortunate because it is such a wild, completely uh, outside-the-box sort of setting that I would have liked to have seen something a bit more kind of uh, over the top. Now, one of the things is, it's kind of like, um, almost like pulp superhero-ish. So characters like, Doc Savage, well, maybe not so much Doc Savage. I think Doc Savage would be a little overpowered for this setting. But uh, like the Shadow, the Spider, things like that, they fit into the Nile Empire. Uh, but then in this adventure, there's some some villains who are, you know, given these, you know, uh, pulp names, like pulp character names not really they really don't have anything you know, there's nothing exciting about it it's just sort of like oh the scorpion yeah and it's, they're called the scorpion okay so yeah i this is uh honestly i think this is pretty much the most disappointing adventure that's in the book and i apologize i mean you know uh, like i said i think the nile empire is pretty cool then next we've got the cyber papacy setting which is really bizarre. Uh, this is the sort of thing that, uh, this is sort of the thing, this is the sort of thing that upsets uh, people who aren't familiar with role-playing games because it's, there's, this, there's this cyber pope who of course is opposed to the real pope. Uh, and there, it's like a bizarre, this is, this is a very cyberpunkish, um, very paranoid, setting very cool i really dig the setting but like i said it's uh probably one of the tougher ones to pull off without like being offensive especially the catholics i would think uh but this adventure is is actually kind of cool it is pretty cool um i wish in this adventure here there was more detail into the cyber papacy 
uh, because that that is kind of one of the knocks I've got so far with what's out for Torg is you get enough stuff to give you kind of wet your appetite and be like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that sounds cool. But you don't get enough. There isn't enough background. Uh, and to me, that's uh, it's a bit of a letdown. And I, and I get it. I completely understand. There's more products coming out. Uh, the only problem is that, you know, you have to wait for it. It looks like so far everything's going to be kickstarted for Ulysses North America releases. So you have to wait for a Kickstarter. Now, as I mentioned, the Living Land Kickstarter ended and some of the PDF stuff was supposed to be out this month. I don't know if it is or not. And I think the physical stuff is set for like a June release or July release. So a lot of that was already done, but uh, it was very, very successful. <clears throat> and looks like there's a lot of cool stuff in it because it, there is like a campaign that's included in um, in the Living Land. I, I want to say... I think it's called the God Box, is what it's called. I think. <laughs> I might be off. Sorry. All right. So, uh, like I said, Cyber Papacy uh, is pretty interesting. This is uh, this is one where they're taking out a pretty big baddie at the end in order to survive. All right. Then we've got the final, which is Arorsh. I think that's what it's how it's pronounced. Uh, it's a, an anagram for horrors. Uh, this is a this is one of uh, this is a, a cosm that was in original Torg, and uh, this is just the this is the horror. This is the horror setting, uh, and uh, it's pretty pretty bizarre because not only is it like a horror setting, but there's also these um, because not everybody. Uh, coming in from these other realms, these these cosms that are hell bent on taking over the earth, right? Draining the earth of its possibility energy. Uh, there are there are groups who are actually here uh, against their will. <laughs> for some, there are some who have come who are looking to fight the high lords of the various different cosms. And uh, one of them is the Victorians. And they are exactly like the uh, British uh, during the Victorian era. And of course, this horror setting is mainly uh, set in India. So of course, how thrilled do you think the people of India are to see almost like the, the Victorian oppressors reincarnated in their planet, uh, you know, in their world, right? But uh, but this is where you've got like all the like monsters and just you know over the top werewolves, uh, vampires, things like that. So I will point out, this is probably my second least favorite adventure. Uh, I had been told. Now I don't know how it'll pan out in the new Torg attorney, but I have been told in old Torg that the uh, Oresh or Orosh uh, Cosm was pretty tough. Pretty tough to uh, to play in. It had like pretty high like party kill rate and things like that. Now, to me, a lot of people, you know, Call of Cthulhu, and uh, as I've mentioned before umpteen times, run Call of Cthulhu for decades. I was more lenient. I, I was never one, unless, you know, unless it was one of these deals where it's like, well, the players had to sacrifice themselves to save everyone. Well, yeah. But I didn't have that high casualty rate as many people running Call of Cthulhu do. But, uh, yeah, that was something that, uh, that I understand. It had been very difficult for... Um, for game masters and players with the Arorsh setting, uh, just because one of the one of the problems that in, with the original Torg was you would have all these different cosms, and all these public you know, publications would come out, and there were a lot. There is a lot out there for the original Torg, and um, all of a sudden you'd you'd have all these different new rules which were released to incorporate into the various different Cosm books that would come out. 
So of course there was massive power creep that came into it. And then a lot of times these rules wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't jive with rules that were already established in the game. So I think that was part of the problem with this horror cosm as well. So, and then once again, we've got the different threats. Yes, I understand what a corrupted bat <laughs> swarm would probably look like. But uh, like there's these ghost bogs or goss bogs, which are actually in all the various different cosms. Uh, lots of luck really finding many pictures of them to describe them to, to the players. So that is one of, the, one of the knocks that I have so far on the Torg books is not enough artwork. And I mean, there's, there's artwork, don't get me wrong, there's artwork throughout, but not enough applicable artwork in my opinion, because it's not as if you've got a beast theory you can go snag. So, anyway, so that is Tori Eternity Day One Adventures. So, what are my overall thoughts? All right, so this is a product that how how useful it is for yourself, and hopefully the the players have already you know turned off the episode. But as uh, the usefulness of this book is going to really depend on how you want to approach Torg. The, the premise of the, the Day One Adventures is simply to introduce the players to the various different mechanics of the game and do it in a way where it's like, okay, so here, here are the basics. So in the Living Land Adventure, that's really the basics. Then when you move into the Isle Adventure, okay, now we're going to layer on a few other things. Then suddenly, you know, it's just until finally, when you get to the, the last adventure, you should pretty much have all of these mechanics kind of coming to you second nature, which was sort of why I thought the, the final adventure is kind of weak because it really doesn't, I don't recall it incorporating all of the various different mechanics. So if you're looking at, you want to be able to run toward and you want it where it's like, okay, I want my players to all roll up their characters and then I'm gonna teach them how to play. We're gonna learn this system together. Day One Adventures probably isn't going to be for you because you're looking at, the, you know, you're, you're supposed to be using these pre-generated characters for each of these adventures because there are aspects of these pre-gens which mesh with the adventure, whereas just rolling up your own characters, then those Storm Knights probably are not going to be able to uh, succeed. Although a couple of the adventures is like, well, I don't know if you're necessarily gonna succeed, uh, but to have a fighting chance at pulling these off. So, like I said, if you're, if you're looking at, you know, you wanna dive into Torg with your players and your players all wanna create their characters right off the bat, probably not gonna be for you. Uh, if you are someone who really wants to kind of dip their toes in, get a better feel, oh, okay, so we play this adventure and we we worry about, um, you know, uh, attribute checks and skills and combat. Okay, you know, oh, and now we're going to learn about that four-step process, you know, that race against time, the chase sequence mechanism. Yeah, then by all means, definitely pick this up and explain to your players, hey, you know what? We're just playing these adventures to give you a taste of the cosms, kind of give you like, wow, you know, that's totally different than that. Wow, this is this is weird. This is, whoa, horror. And then we got cyberpunk and what's with this cyber pope guy? Then yeah, then uh, definitely I would say it is well worth picking up. Personally, I understand what Ulysses North America and the authors were looking to do is simply just provide some some you know kind of extended adventure ideas as opposed to something where it's like wow we're blowing your socks off with each of these adventures and uh you know your mind is completely blown uh i found as for the adventures are interesting on a varying scale but not a one of them was like wow this is awesome so I do want to point that out. But then again, like I said, I do understand the authors are looking at, hey, we just want to really use this book to introduce people 
to the concepts and the cosms of Tort. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm going to go with 7.2. Uh, it's, it's, it's good. It's not great. I, I mean, it's, you know, and like I said, the usefulness that you will find as a game master for it is going to vary. Your mileage will vary depending on the sort of game master you are and what you're aiming to try to do with your Torg adventures. Uh, the other reason why I'm, I'm kind of not giving it a higher score is it falls into that category once again of where like the, like the core book is like, here's just enough information to make you interested in each of these cosms, and that's it. So, and of course, like I said, I know the various different cosms are going to get probably their own Kickstarters in the future. So, and uh, like I said, the Living Land Kickstarter looked like there was a lot of cool stuff involved in it. And when that comes out, you'll probably know way more about the Living Land than you ever wanted to. So, but anyway, but uh, yeah, pretty good. So it's it's a recommend, I, I recommend it, but I do include those uh, those caveats there. All right, so that is it for today's show. Tomorrow, as I mentioned, I will be reviewing Renegade from Victory Point Games, and uh, that will be pretty fun. Uh, I should have war games for the next few Wednesdays, I believe. I believe there are some things in the mail right now. But anyway, when you're not watching The Daily Dope, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV, well, by now, you know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. Until next time, enjoy your Tuesday. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Thanks again for watching The Daily Dope, presented by The Gaming Gang. If you like this episode, be sure to give it a quick thumbs up. And if you dig the channel, please subscribe. If you'd like to check out our previous episode, click right here. And if you want to check out a somewhat randomly selected episode, give a click right down here. It'll be like opening a box of Cracker Jacks. You just don't know what you'll get. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'm Jeff McAleer.